All right, welcome back. So in our first section, we talked about game expansions, why they're important, and why you should be incorporating your core loop. Now we're going to move on to how you properly brainstorm your game expansions, as well as how you gather the resources and coordinate with the resources in order to actualize the dreams that you have for this great expansion. So hopping on in, we're going to first go over a production overview. What is production? Why is it important? Why should you be considering it for any release, not just game expansions? So I harped on this a lot in our last talk, and I'm going to continue to do so now. But our expansions are a massive undertaking. They're extremely resource intensive. There's a lot of new tech that you need to build. There's a lot of new art that are, is required for this. And there's a lot of planning time and resources that are required in order to create this experience. They're also very risky. There's a lot of unknowns when you're developing this feature. What is the player reception going to be? Is this going to create the moments of joy that I anticipate it's going to be? But not only that, but also in development, questions just naturally are going to arise. Um, it's easy to think about the high level concepts of an expansion and that's one thing, but it's another thing to actually start implementing it where a lot of questions are going to arise as to the specific implementation that's right for your feature. Finding the fun also just takes a lot of time. If you've ever met any game designer, they always harp about finding the fun. It is extremely important. Uh, it's important because it sets up your expansion for success. Obviously, if you don't know what's fun about your feature, how do you expect your players to? And it's also going to mitigate a lot of risk because you're going to put your feature through the stress test to guarantee that it's a fun experience for your players. So with all of this in mind, production helps you prevent disaster. It allows you and your team to avoid crunch. So if you are planning ahead, you're able to understand what all of the tasks are that your team are going to need to do. Um, and when we sit down and we think about what is required to do something, we tend to underestimate how long it's going to take. However, when we're breaking down all those tasks, we're recording how long they actually take, we're gonna get a much more accurate estimation, which is going to allow, to allow us to avoid working long hours, weekends, et cetera, to get our feature out the door. Production allows us to identify design flaws. So through the simple act of writing your ideas down, of documenting it, remember what Red Manta said in the round table, their processes, you're going to be forced to consider the small details. And you're also going to be able to more readily identify work conflicts sooner. So rather than just opening up Studio and starting to develop your feature, through the mere act of writing down every single detail you can think about your feature, a lot of issues are gonna arise. And it's better to identify those issues in week one of development rather than month three. Production allows you to keep the vision focused. So roadmaps allow you to see the bigger picture of when things need to be developed, what the dependencies are of that feature, and how you're going to be able to optimally allocate resources in order to get all of the tasks done. For your team, it's also going to give them tangible and concrete goals. If you just sit down and you start developing a feature, there might be no end in sight seemingly for people who are developing the feature, However, if you have that all recorded, they know exactly how many tasks are left and how close they are to delivering on the experience. Production allows you to develop a, a battle plan. So the last thing you want to do is ship this highly ambitious, extremely risky feature and not have a plan for both good and bad. Uh, is this going to be received well by players? If so, what are your next steps? Is there going to be an outcry by some changes? If so, you probably should be thinking about how you're going to resolve those issues. So production's going to allow you to do that. All right. So this is not a hard rule for every team. And I've seen uh, a lot of variations. Some may argue you could take some of these steps and you can combine them with one another. For the purposes of this talk, I just wanted to break these down into as small of steps as possible, just to explain the significance of each of the steps. But here are the steps that I generally identify for developing a feature. Obviously, first you wanna be brainstorming that major expansion. Then you wanna be documenting it with your team. Through that documentation, you're going to be able to identify your minimum viable product. Following that, you're gonna be able to list out all the tasks needed to accomplish this feature. Then you're gonna be able to cost and estimate how long those features are going to take to complete. Then obviously development, 
followed by testing and iteration. This is an ongoing process. And finally, launch, where you'll be fixing bugs and releasing subsequent updates. So we can break down each of these steps and we can talk about the value of them and some of the best practices I found as I'm developing. So for brainstorming, you wanna establish your goals for the feature. What is this feature about? Is there a problem that you're trying to solve? And how does this incorporate in our core loop? Whiteboarding your ideas or otherwise recording them. I know in the COVID era, whiteboards aren't readily available for our entire team. But you want to be writing down and considering somewhere, what, uh, what are the goals for your feature? What are your ideas? How will this feature work? What are the potential rewards or resources used in this feature? What are some potential themes that we can do? Remember, we want to plan out not just our initial release, but maybe two releases ahead. We also want to give some thought to what's going to happen two years from now. Whiteboarding is an excellent way to record that and force the team to consider that all at once. Are there problems that you're trying to solve, right? Have you been getting overwhelming feedback from your community on some issue with your game? You know, something in your core loop is boring. Uh, they feel like some feature is missing or they feel like some system isn't delivering in the way that you and your team expect it to. Uh, this is the perfect opportunity to consider that and think about what are some solutions that you can do in a fun and unique way in the form of a game expansion. So with that in mind, uh, during this process is typically where you're going to run into a lot of conflict. So I wanted to briefly touch upon conflict resolution. As designers, we're very passionate people, we're very opinionated people, but we shouldn't allow that to get in the way of creating the best experience for our players. So with that being said, you're not going to always agree on the proper solution, but as a designer, it's not your goal to have your idea implemented it's your responsibility to seek the best solution to whatever the problem is that you're trying to uh, resolve. And in light of that, the way that you disagree with one another is extremely important because if you're doing it in a deconstructive way, you're not gonna get anywhere in development and you're ultimately not going to create the best experience possible. So you should always be striving for what's best for the game. You should never make it personal. So. Disagree with the solution being presented, not with the person presenting the solution. I've never met a single person who likes to have themselves insult it when they throw out an idea. This is something where everybody's supposed to be working together, pitching ideas good and bad, and seeking the best solution, the cre most creative solution, the one that gets everyone the most excited. Never go after somebody's character or let your passion get the better of you. This one you're gonna hear a lot, and this is kind of like the golden rule for a game designer, is you should always be seeking to raise solutions, not just problems. You don't wanna be in the person in the room that's simply saying, no, that won't work. You wanna be saying, I don't know if that will work, but what if we did this in order to improve that experience? So for any problem, you should always be seeking to present some sort of solution. Even if you don't think that it's the best solution possible, Presenting solutions are going to move the discussion forward and show that you're trying to work with the team in order to make progress. All right, on to documentation. And we heard Red Manta talk about this a lot. Documentation is extremely important because in the simple act of writing things down, you're forced to identify gaps in development. What are some of the edge cases of this feature that you didn't think about when you were getting excited about the idea, right? Uh, what are some of the blockers that are going to come up? And does this conflict with other systems in some way? When you're writing down every single detail that you possibly can about the feature, you're forced to think about those things. And the sooner you identify those gaps, the more time that you're going to save. The nightmare scenario is that you find some issue that makes it impossible to implement this feature two months after you've already started to develop it, your development. Uh, so documentation is going to allow you to avoid that or at least extremely mitigate that risk. So that's why I say you should be writing in as much detail as possible. For teams I've worked on, your documents ultimately become a blueprint for the team where they can go line by line and implement the feature. So not just for you, but for the people that are implementing the feature, this is going to save a significant amount of time because they don't have to pause every line to walk over to somebody and ask what exactly they meant by it. Your documents are also going to facilitate discussion. So ideally, after you write your document, your team is going to review it. They're going to try 
and provide as much feedback as possible. Your responsibility, if you are not the document writer, is to try and make it as bulletproof as possible. You should be trying to identify any edge, edge cases, any issues that you can, and discuss that with the team in order to make that feature better. And then personally, for the designer writing the document, that feedback is going to make you better. You need to have a, a thick skin as a designer, and you need to be willing to take that feedback because that feedback is ultimately going to create the best experience possible. Our next step after we've documented is to identify our minimum viable product. So we talked about this with Red Manta and I'll cover it again. Your minimum viable product is the, simple, the simplest implementation of your grand idea. It's answering the question of what are the minimum features that are required in order to create this core fun experience that I'm trying to release. So with your minimum viable product, you should be striving to build the basic framework with your initial release and then iterate over time. If you're looking to release the perfect feature, you're risking never shipping that feature because there's always something that you can do better on the feature. So you should try and take your best first crack at it and then release that after you've uh, tested it with your team and you've iterated over time. The other thing that you heard Ren Van to say is that player feedback is critical for iteration. And it is very true. Uh, it doesn't make sense to try and stick every system into your feature all at once, only to have it be poorly received by the player. When you release that basic framework, you can directionally get feedback from them that will send you towards the systems that should belong in your feature. Uh, you should identify and prioritize your feature with your team. So what is critical for the first release? What systems can you throw into the backlog? And what systems are good candidates for a future iteration, maybe on your first or second subsequent release of the initial feature? All right. Our next step that we want to do is we want to break down the tasks. So we want to identify what are all the tasks that are required to build this feature? What are the programming tasks that we need? What are the art tasks? What are the UI tasks? What are the design or the data input tasks? What is our implementation for V1 or V2 of this feature? All of those should be discussed and identifying those tasks are going to allow your team to better execute on the entire plan. You also wanna organize that ta those tasks. So you in a production management software, um, I think some common ones are Trello, Jira, uh, Hack and Plan. You wanna list all of those tasks. And then you wanna assign those tasks to the team that are responsible. Is this a programming task? Is this an art task? Is this a design task? You wanna identify any task dependencies. Can the designer not work on this feature until the programmer does? These are important steps that you would rather figure out at the beginning rather than in development. Next, you wanna assign and you wanna cost the tasks. So basically, whoever is responsible for doing that task, you want them to estimate how long that task is going to take. Um, my advice for you is to assume six hour work days. I know we say that we work eight hours, but the reality is between lunch meetings and other things during the day, we really only have about six hours of productivity during the day. So when you're estimating a task, you should be thinking about it in that regard. And for you personally, if you are uncomfortable uh, costing that task, you may rely on a more experienced team member in order to assist in estimating. The experience of the assignees should be factored in as well. Uh, if I am brand new to programming and I just joined the team, maybe give them some extra time to figure some things out. Um, the other important thing about costing is that you should be baking or you should be baking in uh, iteration and testing time. This isn't an estimate of how quickly it takes to implement your first implementation. It's how long to get the task done. And the first attempts at costing may be difficult, uh, but that is okay as long as you're getting into the practice of improving this estimation. Remember, our goal at the end of the day is to avoid crunch at all costs. Crunch leads to uh, less polished experiences and stupid mistakes. So we should try to avoid that at all costs. Following that, we're gonna hop into development. So these are some development best practices that I've found over time. First, we wanna be tracking progress. Um, 
through our actions of tracking it, we're going to be able to investigate any issues and see if we can have other team members assist if things are lagging behind. The other thing that I wanna note here is if you notice that your, your progress is lagging over time, you should never hesitate to delay. The health of your team um, and their ability to get their job done is way more important than when you release this feature. You heard that this is actually a common practice for Red Manta where when they are getting close to release, if they feel like it is not there, rather than crunch crazy hours, they decide to move the release out. So your team health is extremely important. You should play test often as well. So your, your first job should be to get this feature playable as soon as possible. Get a prototype up as soon as possible. Get your team playing this. That way you can see what you're actually building and surface issues much sooner. So it's not a matter of designing in or building in a black box and then suddenly moving to closed beta. You should be scheduling weekly play tests with your team where you all play together and you all provide feedback. That way you always have a heartbeat on where the feature is and what pivots need to be made in order to drive the feature success. So yes, you should also be meeting weekly to discuss feature progress. So not only playing the feature, but sharing the team progress. Get into a room, hop on a call, discuss what you've accomplished for that week, surface any development issues, and make sure that everyone's keeping their eye on the prize. This is great for you as a lead to understand where you are in your progress and be able to make decision of whether we need to pivot, cut features, or simply move the date out. Okay, once we've gotten it to a playable state, we wanna move on to testing and iteration. So for testing, you should establish a, a routine play test, as I said. Uh, once again, this is just great for seeing your overall development progress and detecting issues earlier with your team. You should be setting expectation for your play test. Never going into a play test and say, okay, go. You wanna establish what is being play test. You wanna establish what new features are in the build. And you wanna make sure that you're focusing everyone's feedback on a specific system. These are meant to get the most value out of them. So don't waste everybody's time by just setting up arbitrary play tests. You wanna capture all feedback and bugs that you experience during the play test. Um, again, a, pro a production management software is going to be invaluable for this. And then leads should spend time prioritizing and determining what feedback to act upon. So next I wanna talk about iteration versus feature creep. Iteration is essential for development. It allows us to find the best uh, experience possible in our game. And there is never the case where our design is going to go from brainstorming all the way to the live game. We constantly wanna be improving the experience over time. Something that sounds amazing on paper might actually play out very poorly in our game. And so our feedback helps us refine this experience. At the same time, be aware of the quantity of changes made. You should reevaluate your release date if too many changes are needed. Um, otherwise, you should make a cost analysis of what is the most valuable pieces of feedback that you should act upon. So you should be aware of the cost of the changes and you should evaluate the priority. As Nate said in the round table, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Consider future updates for some of the proposed changes and keep your eye on the minimum viable products. Some of the things that you might think are a big deal now might actually be completely irrelevant once you have player reception. So you should try and ship something that is playable and that you consider to be fun, not something that is absolutely perfect and has every single aspect that you feel should be in that feature in the initial release. Okay, so we've tested it, we've iterated, and now we're going to launch but before we do, you should be marketing and hyping your feature. So there's a few steps that you can take in order to market your, your feature. First, you can preview it to all of your players. Let them know what you're working on. Let them know what they should be excited about. You also want to take note of community reactions. How did they receive this, this preview of your game? Are they excited? Are they nervous? Are they upset? Uh, that's going to allow you to pivot and reconsider certain things about the feature you're working on. You should also be getting involved in social media. You should let players know that there are people that are behind the games and that they're passionate and that they care about the community. 
The other thing with your social platforms is that your most engaged players are going to be on there. And so engaging with them on these platforms is going to further drive that engagement. Social media is also going to give you a competitive advantage. A lot of your competitors aren't actually using social media. And so if you are the most visible on those social platforms, you're going to be able to get all of the free users that those other developers aren't leveraging by being present on social media. With your team, you should be planning pre and post launch events. These are content cadence that are leveraging existing systems already in your game in order to generate excitement for the feature coming up. We heard a few of these examples. You release you know, furniture that's themed after the release that's coming up or cosmetics for your characters and pets, or you set up a countdown timer to um, really tease and excite players for this new piece of content that's coming up. Again, though, I can't stress enough, please only leverage systems that already exist in your game. Don't add new tech to this because you're spending those resources on the feature that you are developing. You should be surfacing the feature and the update that's going out. Let the players know that this update is out. So update your game thumbnail and update your landing page. Um, but make sure with your thumbnail especially that you have some recognizable iconography on there. That way players know that it's actually your game. Um, onboard your players. So when your players log into your game for the first time on this exciting release, let them know that the feature is available. And if it's not readily available to them, include some sort of tutorial or flow in order to get them into the flow of the feature itself. Blast on social media when you're live. So announce the release date, announce the feature release. Um, engage with your fans once it's live, that way they know that it's out and in the world and they can all enjoy it. Okay, so some other best practices for your launch day. First, and this is actually in development, you should implement analytics and gather feedback from your players in this way. Are your players engaging in your feature? Are your players making progress on the feature? And are there major areas of drop off in the game that would suggest there's some sort of game breaking bug or flow that needs to be resolved? Um, in a future section today, we will be talking more about analytics in depth but you should definitely have some sort of battle plan for launch day where you have analytics implemented and you're closely tracking them when your feature is live. Gather feedback. What does your community actually think about your feature? Is it fun? Uh, are there any issues that need to be immediately resolved? Is it too difficult? Uh, by actually asking them and joining them in game, you're gonna be able to discover these issues sooner rather than waiting for angry Twitter followers to message you that something is broken in your game. Play your game. You worked, you know, for a month, three months on this feature. Why not celebrate that experience with your players? So enjoying content with your players might also lead to viral moments. Players see that there's a developer on their server. They want to play with you. They want to celebrate with you. They're going to tell all your friends that they're there and all of their friends are also going to join and uh, enjoy the experience. So be proud of the work that has been done and celebrate with your players. Okay. On to bug fixes. Uh, I can't stress this enough, but your very first release after the initial release of your content should be a bug fix release. It should be dedicated to fixing bugs, should be dedicated to polishing this new and ambitious feature that you're working on. The reason why you wanna do this is because it shows your players that you care. Uh, and the other reason, as I'm sure you have all experienced in the past, if you ignore bugs, they will only compound over time. So you should dedicate an entire week simply to squashing these bugs, polishing the feature, and making it the best possible experience. You want to prioritize, and we'll talk about this in a bit as well, but how critical is an issue to resolve, and will the changes make a measurable impact for players? The other thing that you need to ask here is what is your team actually capable of in this time? There's only so much time in the day versus when you need to make this release, so make the most of it and identify the uh, issues that need to be resolved that are gonna give you the most bang for your buck and the time that's spent working on them. All right, and finally, now that this feature is a core part of your game, you can think about what are the next steps for the feature. So you can revisit your backlog. What didn't make it in at launch? What did we cut in the name of our minimum viable product? 
Is it still something that's applicable to the game? Um, are there any of these updates that are still of value? And are there any other insights that have arised now that this is out into the wild and your players are playing? Now is the time to consider it once the feature is live. You wanna prioritize your feature updates. So what features are important to work on next? And how can you iterate and improve upon the feature? All right, looks like we have some great questions in Slido. So Dan, Thunder1222 asks, if your game is not ready to be released, but ends up getting lots of attention from influencers, can that be bad for the overall health of the game? As in the game is not ready for that type of attention. Um, are, not necessarily, um, it depends. If you have released the feature and it's getting that attention, um, yes, it's all hands on deck to try and get that feature polished and, and to where it needs to be. Although the thing you have to remember is if you have attention from influencers on there, then your, your feature is already somewhat successful. If we're talking about pre-release of the feature and an influencer has hopped into your game and has you know, skyrocketed the features, I would not risk releasing the feature just because there's more players that are playing at that particular moment. Again, ultimately your goal should be to release when ready, not just because players are demanding it. So you should be taking the time and the care to get the feature out when it's ready, because otherwise you're gonna create a lot of really poor experiences for players um, and there's going to be a lot of drop off. So essentially you'd be shooting yourself in the foot. That first launch of your feature is the most important impression that you're gonna leave on players. So you wanna set it up for the most success possible, not just because your game is you know, popular at any particular time. Great, thank you, Dan. Prime Hyde asks, how important should community feedback be on previews? Most people that go the extra mile to keep track of previews and follow your socials will have the loudest voice, but mostly represent in-game users so they don't offer a proportional view. Yes, good question. And we'll actually talk about it later today, but community feedback is important and you should always be living or listening to it. However, you are the vision holder for your game and you should never stick content into your game simply because the players are demanding it. Even if you think that one of their ideas is good, you should be considering what the correct implementation is for your game, what the proper way to roll it out is. So in a sense, when you think that a, a player has a good idea, you should be thinking about the spirit of the request or the spirit of the idea, and you should be implementing it in the way that you believe in, not just what they say, but never ever allow your player base to dictate exactly what you're putting into your game. Awesome. All right, this one's from me. What are your recommendations for recruiting play testers, especially for individual devs who do not have a team to test with? Sure, so there's a few things that you can do. Um, if you tuned in to the Red Manta Roundtable earlier, uh, they simply identified very passionate fans within the community on Discord and said, hey, would you like to play test our feature and incorporate it in there? So you can do the same. And this is another value of engaging with your player base is that you can meet players that are passionate enough that they wanna play test this with you. So that is one input that you have. Another is that there are dedicated uh, Roblox QA discords where there are teams that can QA for you. So if you are unable to generate enough buzz in your community for a play test, then you could seek out that group and you could also get play tests done with that group. That's an awesome resource. Thanks, Dan. And last question, Tech Spectrum asks, what is your favorite documentation tool? Confluence, Google Docs, pen and paper, Miro, whiteboard, et cetera. Personal thoughts, a combination of Confluence and Miro as a whiteboard has been the best documentation for our team so far. Yeah, good question. Um, for me in the past, it has depended on the team. I have used Confluence extensively and I think that's a very good resource. I also think Google Docs I've, I've also used in the past and that's also a good resource. I like the ability in Google Docs to have people comment on it and have conversations on the side for a specific thing and be able to iterate that way. So especially like while you're working remotely with one another, 
Um, Google Docs for me is, is a great resource because then I can have ongoing conversations with people as we're trying to iterate on an idea and get it to the perfect place. You also have like certain functionality in there where you can like do drawings and you can do mock-ups of like different UI and stuff. So, and you also have like a nice navigation tool in the form of the header where you can like just jump to the sections that you actually care about. Um, I think for any of them, I don't think that there's an incorrect answer there. I think as long as you're writing down your ideas and you're discussing with your team, you're already winning. Um, but those are two of the resources that I've used um, historically that I've found pretty useful. Great, thank you.